So welcome to the physiology uh, seminar this week. And today uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Jen Xu, uh, who is uh, one of our own outstanding colleagues. And um, he came from the uh, Children's um, uh, Research Institute uh, located at the NC building. And um, Jen um, received his bachelor's degree from Fudan University and then uh, his master's degree also from Fudan University um, in 2003. And then he joined the uh, graduate program at UCLA and obtained his uh, PhD at 2008. Oh, um, I'm sorry. He joined at 2003 and obtained his uh, degree at 2008. And in 2008, and uh, he obtained this uh, Helen Hay Whitney HHMI past postdoc fellow, and um, and become a, a postdoc in um, in in the Stuart Arkins lab at uh, Boston Children's Hospital, and of course also part of the Harvard Medical School. And um, in 2012. Um, he also become an instructor there. In 2014, uh, we are lucky, and of course, it's the Children's Research Center. We're lucky to be able to recruit Jane to become a faculty um, as an endowed scholar um, um, at um, um, UT Southwestern. So in 2020, he was promoted to the social professor. And one thing I'm really impressed about Jen is that he had this almost uh, lifelong scientific interest in studying the regulation of gene transcription. And uh, he is one of, I think, one of the best experts in terms of study transcriptions, specifically the function of enhancers at genomic level. Um, in 2017, he published a very seminal paper in Cell, which he developed a, a CRISPR-based uh, method to um, perform in vivo capture of chromatin genome-wide. And that can provide really unprecedented um, mechanistic details, how enhancers work, how transcriptions are regulated. So uh, without further ado, I think um, today, he's going to tell us about uh, the decoding of pathogenic non-coding genome in development and disorders. Um, welcome to Physiology. Jane, it's all yours. Thank you, Yi. Thank you, Yi, for the very nice uh, introduction and uh, kind of invitation. Um, it's good to have a, a home game here and, and present the Physiology uh, seminar series and share some of our recent work on the study of uh, non-coding regulatory genome in um, particularly blood development disorders. Um, so I would like to start with a brief introduction. So as E introduced, I, I started my lab here in year 2014 after my postdoc training um, with Stu Hawking. So my lab studies a mechanism that regulate gene expression during um, stem cell differentiation and how deregulation of these mechanisms underline the development of a variety of human disorders. And more specifically, we aim to understand how lineage-specific transcription factors and um, epigenetic regulators uh, cooperate with um, environmental signals to control cell identity by often acting a set of cis regulatory elements such as transcriptional enhancers. Um, as a background, so we all know that the, uh, the human genome consists of about 20,000 uh, proteins, protein coding genes, but only 1% uh, of the total genomic space. The other 99% are so called non coding regulatory elements, um, including about 25% of them are thought to have regulatory rules, and another 50% of them are repetitive DNA sequences. On the other hand, um, from a uh, human genetic studies uh, that we know the vast majority of known disease-associated genetic variants, these are single, single, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, they often locate in the non-coding genome, but identifying the causal mechanisms um, has remained a significant challenge. Um, but in select cases, uh, a careful dissection of the underlying pathways can often lead to new insights in human genetics and therapeutics. 
So for example, by associating common genetic variation uh, with specific uh, phenotypes such as uh, blood traits or fetal hemoglobin levels or the severity of sickle cell disease, uh, monogenic uh, uh, anemia uh, disorder, a gene called BCL11A uh, was discovered now more than 10 years ago. So the work I did as a postdoc fellow in Stu Hawkins lab together with Vijay Sankar and Dan Bauer showed that these genetic variants that was initially identified to associate with uh, blood trace do not affect the protein coding sequences of this gene BCL11A. Instead, uh, they uh, overlap uh, with a, a tissue specific transcriptional enhancer that are located in the second intron of this, um, uh, of this gene on chromosome uh, two. <clears throat> so um, after many years of work done by um, um, colleagues in, in working lab uh, and some of my work, and we now know how this works. So normally BCL11A is transcriptionally activated by these intronic enhancer elements. And itself encodes a transcriptional repressor and functions to repress fetal hemoglobin um, during uh, asteroid development, such that in, in healthy individuals, that 99% um, of the globin genes are transcribed from these adult beta globin genes, and the fetal globin genes are expressed at extremely low levels. And the GWASH variant um, basically functions to attenuate the enhancer function, and this results in less BCNO expression and a modest increase of fetal hemoglobin expression. And because fetal hemoglobin uh, can compensate for adult hemoglobin, particularly in the cases when adult beta globin gene is mutated, uh, such as in the case of sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia, and this has previously sought to ameliorate the disease symptoms. So this is how the genetics uh, studies initially worked because they identified natural variants they associate with mild disease symptoms, and it turns out that these natural variants regulate the transcriptional repressor of fetal hemoglobin expression. And uh, this raised the, uh, the uh, possibility that uh, by targeting this enhancer, perhaps we can further increase fetal hemoglobin expression for therapy. And this indeed has been shown uh, by either genetic inactivation of this tissue specific enhancer uh, in, in mouse models or recently by genome editing in primary human hematopoietic cells. So um, this finding not only established the underlying genetic basis of hemoglobin switching that has been kind of discovered for a, a, a three or four decades now, but also raised the possibility that tissue specific enhancers may be therapeutic uh, targets to treat the major hemoglobin disorders, uh, such as sickle cell disease that are currently affect uh, nearly 5% of the world's population. So this, uh, this discovery of disease-associated bcl one enhancer now have led to uh, a two ongoing clinical trials uh, by CRISPR Therapeutics in partnership with Vertex to target the bcl one enhancer in sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia patients using genome editing. So the way it works is first to mobilize CD34 positive hematopoietic stem progenitor cells from affected individuals. And then these cells can be transiently expanded uh, ex vivo in a, in a culture dish. And while they're doing so, they transduce a cell with rubber nuclear proteins containing Cas9 nucleus with a single guard RNA targeting the BCLNA enhancer that we discovered. And this will lead to disruption of the enhancer function. Um, and, and, and these edited cells can uh, be selected and reinfused back to the same patient and observe for disease phenotype. And the results of the first two patients that were recently, uh, uh, that has been treated, uh, were recently reported in a New England Journal of Medicine paper, uh, end of last year, together with another report uh, using SHRNA-based gene, uh, gene therapy approach to inactivate bcr you know, right? kind of the traditional way of doing this, and also published in a back-to-back -back paper in New England Journal of Medicine. So as one example here shows the result of the first beta thalassemia patient treated by Cas9 editing of the bcl 11 a enhancer. So as you can see it's showing on the left, before infusion, this patient um, had um, a total hemoglobin level 9.0 gram to deciliter with fetal hemoglobin level only 0.3 gram to deciliter. And this is severely anemic because a normal uh, health individual should have the range between 12 and 14. 
And just about two months after infusion of the LED cells, feeding hemoglobin at, uh, level increased to 6.5 and later stabilized about 13.1 13.5 gram to deciliter, with total hemoglobin level now increased to 14.1. This is a normal range. And this is accompanied by uh, uh, nearly 100% of these so-called F cells, basically a feeding hemoglobin positive cells, starting from six months after uh, the infusion. Moreover, oh, this- so, so can I ask a quick question? Yeah, so of course, when, when yeah, they, feel free to ask question. When they infuse this back to the patients, how, how high is the efficiency of the uh, um, editing? Yeah, so uh, in the initial report, um, they, um, they work out a pretty good protocol to deliver Cas9 rubber nuclear proteins, and they can get a total edit efficiency about 85, uh, in some cases achieving 95. And the question is uh, how many uh, heterozygous, how many uh, homozygous, but if they are achieving 95% edit efficiency, I would think that a majority of those cells are homozygous, they edit it. Um, and they have uh, followed up though on those cases. So apparently the, the technology has evolved quite a bit over the years that uh, uh, the edit efficiency in primary human hematopoietic stem progenitor cells can be very high now. Okay. So uh, moreover, this patient- um, hold, uh, hold, hold on, I see DJ also has a question here. Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, I have a quick question here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, DJ, um, go ahead. Why, why turning on the, the fetal program also inhibit the adult hemoglobin in, in this trial? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is called hemoglobin switch. Um, so basically, this is a normal developmental switch that happens uh, in every one of us when, when we are little, uh, uh, when we are in a fetus, actually, we uh, predominantly express feeding hemoglobin. And then uh, usually after year birth, and they start to switch to adult beta globin. And by um, usually more than two or three years old, that feeding hemoglobin is dropped to less than one to two percent. Uh, so this is a natural switch that's regulated by BCLMA as a repressor that, uh, that specifically turns on during adult uh, sorry, cells to, uh, to uh, repress uh, um, feeding hemoglobin expression. So, so the, the gene therapy approach basically leverage this natural switching process such that if you can turn on gamma globin expression, uh, not only you can increase uh, this feeding hemoglobin, but also you downregulate this mutant adult beta globin that's causing the sickle cell. Yeah, I understand that. My, my question is about how does, that's also my uh, rich, um, ec uh, um, orchestrated by BCL11A protein, so that, that's the activator of adult or? or... No, uh, so yeah, that's a great question. So uh, uh, um, there's a, a number of activators has been previously discovered to control activation of beta globin gene expression. The prominent ones are GATA1, TAL1, and many of you know, um, but, but there has not been a single repressor protein uh, before BCLMA. Uh, uh, has been uh, proposed. So, the, so there's two scores of thoughts. One of them is saying that, oh, there must be a, 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 a transcriptional activator that is specifically expressed in the fetal stage that, that keeps the fetal moving on. And when the cells switch to the adult stages, maybe the activator is, uh, is no longer expressed. But then the second score so, uh, uh, source is that there might be a developmental stage specific repressors. And these uh, uh, was, uh, as, um, subsequently uh, validated to be the case um, uh, after discovery of BCLMA as, as a major repressor for feeding globin expression. So the, the, uh, the detailed mechanism is still largely unclear how, how this uh, BCLMA become activated in a dose-specific manner. Uh, but the recent study, again, from Walking Lab showing there's a competition model that BCLMA binding site uh, at the gamma globin promoter is, uh, is within 17 best pair uh, next to an activator uh, called NFY binding site. So once BCLMA binds there, NFY can no longer bind. And NFY is thought to be the kind of the ubiquitous transcriptional uh, activator for activating transcriptional, uh, the gamma globin gene transcription. So, but uh, still there's uh, other models have been proposed such as BCLMA might regulate 3D genome conformation and other means that uh, has yet to be figured out. Thank you. So great, um, thanks for all that great questions. 
So uh, just want to mention uh, uh, for this part that this patient initially required monthly transfusions before the treatment because of a severe anemia. But uh, as you noted that, uh, but uh, he no longer uh, need any transfusion uh, after infusion of these additive cells during the 22 months follow up. So clinically, this patient is cured, even though they still carries the genetic mutations. Um, um, so therefore, uh, therapeutic targeting of disease-associated PCL1 enhancer uh, likely provides a cure for the most common monogenic uh, human disease first described uh, by James Herrick over a century ago. So uh, I want to come back to the human genome. So as we know that uh, protein okay. coding gene is only about 1% of the genome. I think you have another have. question. Yeah, another question. Um, yes. Yeah. From... Uh, thanks. Um, I was just curious, like, functionally, is there any difference between the fetal hemoglobin and the adult uh, hemoglobin? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, functionally, it does not seem to be a major uh, differences between fetal hemoglobin and adult hemoglobin. Although, uh, by physically, it has been noted that uh, feeding hemoglobin have slightly higher oxygen affinity compared to adult globin. And it has been thought that because during fetal development, the fetus need to absorb uh, the oxygen from, from, uh, from maternal uh, uh, during, during uh, uh, development. And the slightly higher oxygen affinity might help kind of the oxygen exchange uh, in placenta. But uh, there's genetic um, deletions of adult beta globins. Uh, in certain uh, uh, females, uh, in women actually, uh, that still can give birth to healthy babies. Um, so it looks like this, this evolution of selection of high, slightly higher oxygen affinity uh, form of feeding hemoglobin uh, at least did not seem to affect uh, 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 fetal development uh, in those rare cases of uh, adult globin deletions. Well, um, I mean I guess the, what I find interesting is that the system evolved to make this transition between the fetal hemoglobin and the adult hemoglobin. And mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering, like in a situation where, say, like the example you gave where the adult hemoglobin um, is lost, um, are these individuals susceptible, more susceptible to hypoxia? Do they have, do they have compromised ability to, to survive at high altitude? Or is there anything, I, I guess, like under steady state conditions, there may not be an obvious difference, but when right. you start to start pushing the system, maybe that's where the big differences come out. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's clearly uh, possible. I mean, in terms of response to hypoxia, and that's a more complicated matter because other than feeding hemoglobin oxygen, trans, uh, oxygen affinity, there's many uh, in terms of the hemoglobin uh, half-lives and the, the, the tetramer they form and how the red blood cell indexes in terms of red blood cell number and half-life, all those can uh, affect the physiology of oxygen uh, sensitivity. So I, I don't think the, the, the merely the, the, um, the variation of feeding hemoglobin expression level um, can predict uh, or, or um, associate with feeding, um, uh, oxygen sensitivity on a, a high attitude or hypoxia, but, but um, it's part of the process, I will say. But the whole uh, red blood cell program has evolved during evolution. Interestingly, in that, for example, mouse don't really have a feeding hemoglobin, but human and, and some of the new world monkeys um, start to have this uh, feeding hemoglobin during evolution. The thought process was that uh, those uh, primates have longer gestation, and perhaps um, having feeding hemoglobin will, will be advantageous for, for these species to, to evolve, um, but some of those lower species don't seem to. But this is just a theory. And I, think, I think we probably should move on. Now. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, this is a great discussion. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so I want to come back to kind of uh, our focus in understanding how transcriptional enhancers um, uh, regulate uh, gene expression during development. So first of all, uh, what are enhancers? So enhancer was first discovered 40 years ago by these uh, gentlemen as a short DNA sequence is actually in a viral genome, SV40, uh, that can enhance expression of uh, a transient, interesting beta globin at that time they used uh, in a transient transfection assay uh, in the orientation independent manner uh, as they initially showed. And then a couple of years later, uh, the first cellular enhancer was cloned from a mouse uh, immunoglobin heavy chain gene uh, that was also shown to activate gene transcription in a tissue specific manner. 
So therefore, even from the very early days, enhance are defined as cis-acting DNA sequences that can function at a distance to activate gene transcription in an orientation independent and tissue specific manner. And because of these unique features, it has been difficult to study enhancers. And it's still difficult to identify enhancer target genes because they can often look at far, far away from the gene they regulate. And, and uh, their in vivo function are largely unknown uh, and largely due to the lack of experimental tools to study them. So uh, with the advances of uh, next-gen sequencing uh, the couple with analysis of various chromatin features, we can now easily annotate uh, uh, most of the non-coding genome using a number of uh, methods such as chip sequencing uh, to examine uh, protein DNA interactions at the genome-wide scale, ATAC sequencing or DNS1 hypersensitivity assay to examine chromatin accessibility as a surrogate for active transcription, as well as chromatin conformation capture or uh, a 3C or high c method to examine high order chromatin structures. So using this method, uh, we can now use a simple combination of enhancer or promoter associated histone modifications and a chromatin accessibility to identify putative enhancers or other regulatory elements across the genome. So again, should, uh, using our uh, ferro locus human, human beta globin gene cluster as example, here using a simple combination of DNS1 hypersensitivity mapping, now you can use ATAC-C very easily, uh, H3K27 acetylation, monomers of K4, uh, chip sequencing, you can easily identify uh, the individual enhancer element uh, at the upstream locus control region or LCR that control uh, the, uh, um, the developmental switching of these five glo uh, beta-like globin genes. As you might notice that active promoters have trimethylation K4. I'm not showing here the uh, repressed promoters often have trimethylation K27. So using this method, uh, uh, we previously compared the enhanced landscape between human uh, primary hematopoietic stem progenitor cells uh, or HSPCs uh, that are originated from fetal cells or adult cells uh, versus lineage commit, committed estuary uh, precursors called proes. And it's quite uh, striking that just within a few cell divisions as the cells make lineage decisions, uh, there is massive turnover enhancer such that two thirds of the enhancer that you normally see in, in stem progenitor cells are lost and replaced by estuary specific enhancers uh, just in uh, a matter of cell uh, divisions. And this strongly suggests that there's a pervasive enhancer turnover during lineage differentiation uh, of these hematopoietic stem progenitors and perhaps uh, most of the somatic cells. And we use this as a kind of a test bed to study enhancer function and learn quite a, a few interesting features. Uh, the one is that enhancer function can of, uh, often cannot be reliably predicted based on only quantum features. Other important features such as transcription factor binding and a, a 3D uh, quantum interactions are, are critical for uh, predicting enhancer function. And this really highlights that a study enhancer regulation really requires understanding its regulation in this native quantum environment, uh, ideally in situ, uh, in vivo. And this led us uh, to address two uh, important questions that um, uh, in the field, that is uh, how are enhancer organized and regulated in this native quantum environment? And how do you enhance the control spatial temporal gene expression in vivo, particularly during uh, animal development uh, uh, when these cells are making uh, lineage decisions? So, uh, in an attempt to address the first question, um, so we recently engineered an in situ capture assay to identify enhance the regulating chromatin interactions by repurposing a CRISPR Cas9 technology. So, we all know how CRISPR Cas9 uh, works. The idea is pretty straightforward is that by combining gene-specific or enhancer-specific gata RNA sequence that you can design, together with an enzyme dead version of Cas9 called DCAS9, and this complex can be uh, targeted to the proximity of any enhancer or promoter or other regular elements that you might be interested. We made uh, several modifications, including adding an epitope tag that can be in vivo by tinnitus uh, in, in, in these cells. And then um, by uh, high affinity strip evidence, uh, biotin uh, affinity purification, we can capture the, the enhancers and all the associated molecular interactions to systematically dissect the enhancer associated proteins using, for example, downstream uh, um, mass spec analysis, uh, enhancer associated RNAs using uh, RNA-seq and enhancer uh, associated 3D chromatin interactions 
uh, using a long range uh, um, uh, 3C based technologies. So, so the main advantage of this system is number one, it allow us to capture chromatin reactions in, in native chromatin context without any perturbation. And this is not dependent on predefined factors, unlike chip sequencing or, or, or other method that you will need a high quality antibody to pull down a factor that you might be interested in. Here, since we are pulling down the, uh, the DNA based on a gut RNA targeting, so that uh, we don't actually need to know what are the protein factors that, that are associated with a, a complex and you might be interested. And because we use strip avenue of uh, biotin interaction, which is uh, known to be the uh, strongest non-covalent interactions in nature, and this allows a high sensitivity and a specificity that we can use very stringent biochemical isolation methods. And because we use gut RNA for targeting, and this allows multiplex capture many enhancers. In our recent study, we can capture up to almost 2,000 enhancers in a single experiment. And this should be uh, generally applicable to, to any genomic loci or other model systems. So, so uh, to address the second question, how do enhance the control of special temporal gene expression, and particularly during in vivo development? Uh, we saw that we will benefit from a, 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 a kind of a, a new method that allow us to activate or repress enhancer from its endogenous chromatin environment. So we have thought about the CRISPR-Cas9 again, and this is uh, often known as CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I, but in our hands, CRISPR-A, CRISPR-I, the original CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I does not work very well for enhancers, largely because uh, it was designed based on the principle of prom uh, promoter-associated quantitative features. So we sought to involve this system by considering the, the enhancer-associated histone modifications, particularly uh, histone acetylation, K27, uh, acetylation and a histone a methylation uh, that can be modulated by different epigenetic regulators. So we came up with this, what we call enhancer targeting CRISPR-A or CRISPR-I, uh, such that um, uh, for, for enhanced activation, we fuse DCAS9 protein with an activated domain P300, which is known to acetylate histone uh, H3K27. And we then engineered a, a, a sgRNA with a MS2 helpings uh, which can be uh, recognized by RNA binding domain called MCP. And then we can fuse this MCP RNA binding domain with another activator uh, called VP64 to assemble these uh, enhancer activating sim uh, systems. Similar idea for enhanced re repression, such that we use LSD1, which is a histone demethylase, to remove uh, monomethyl K4, which is another active hallmark of active enhancers. And we use MCP and MS2 to recruit KRAP. So, so the, I, the idea is that uh, basically we incorporate uh, multiple independent activating or repression mechanisms using this uh, DCAS9 scaffold to kind of maximize the activation or repression activity. So um, we use this system in a variety of cell models. Uh, I won't show the data um, and, and show that the new system indeed are, are superior than the original CRISPR-I and CRISPR-I system for enhanced perturbations. However, the main challenge is analysis enhancer function during in vivo development. Uh, so we went ahead and generated a knocking mouse model containing a, a, a inducible DCAS9 KRAP, a chimeric gene uh, knocking to the uh, College 101 locus, and then use a gut RNA construct that containing this MS2 and a fusion protein with LSD1, you can assemble this uh, increased per eye system in, in, in primary cells in vivo. So with this system, we thought that now we have a tool that we can perturb enhancer function during in vivo development, and, and particularly using hematopoietic uh, uh, differentiation as a model. So we reason that um, by, for example, uh, repressing uh, lineage-specific enhancer in hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, uh, followed by bone marrow transplant, we could assay these donor-derived mature cell lineages, such as myelo cells, B cells, and T cells, as a functional readout of whether or not repression of those enhancers in the stem cells affect lineage decision uh, later on. And uh, the readout is basically isolate a genomic DNA uh, of these mature cells and compare with the starting cells before transplantation and perform amplicon sequencing to uh, 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 identify sgRNA that are enriched or dropped out uh, in this uh, differentiation scheme. So as a proof of principle, we started with some uh, uh, knowing transcription factors and their enhancers for this uh, in vivo enhancer perturbation screens. So here I'm showing one piece of data as a one example. 
and this is a, a data for the uh, CBDR fund uh, gene. This gene has a, a annotated four uh, independent enhanced element look at a different locations of this uh, uh, transcription star site. And, and interestingly, by this in vivo perturbation, we find two of these enhancers and their corresponding RNAs, uh, gut RNAs, are significantly depleted in myeloid cells, but not in B and T cells. So this means that repression of these two enhancers can significantly impair myeloid cell differentiation, uh, resulting in a depletion of these corresponding gut RNAs uh, in those mature myeloid cells. And this was uh, reassuring because uh, CBBF found knockout as well as an enhancer for this plus 37 KB enhancer knockout has previously been uh, generated and showing to affect myeloid cell differentiation without affecting lymphopoiesis. So our data nicely uh, uh, reproduce those findings. Uh, we also show that this E2 enhancer is also important for myeloid cell differentiation, but not for the other two lineages. But none of the other two enhancers uh, seems to be important. And I, I wanna highlight this is important because instead of generating uh, enhancer knockout, gene knockout, uh, which is very time consuming and, and, and labor intensive, and we can design a set of gut RNAs and scan a whole locus and get a, a, a functional assessment of whether or not uh, any regulatory elements might be important or even a gene might be important if you design gut RNA target to the gene promoters. So I, along this idea, uh, we performed a, a multiplex enhancer perturbation by a pool in gut RNA for 60 different enhancers. So here's about 200 gut RNAs in this uh, in vivo experiment. So in a single experiment, you can identify systematically what are the enhancer genes that are specifically required for myeloid cell differentiation, B cell differentiation, T cells, et cetera. Often you're gonna see there's enhancers that are particularly important for myeloid, but not for B and T cells. So we think this, uh, this uh, in vivo perturbation system can provide a useful a system for functional interrogation of cis regulatory elements, such as enhancers during in vivo development. And moreover, by combining this uh, knock in mouse model with other disease models, for example, uh, 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 leukemia models, we can study enhancer function during different pathological processes. So uh, as a brief Eugene? summary. Uh, no, go yes, ahead. Go is ahead. there another question? Yeah, can you go back one? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, maybe you went up pretty fast. Can you explain why is it, I mean, the, the, some of the enhancers are specific for myeloid and not for BNT? How does, I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's very, uh, this, is, this is one of the, uh, I would say, fundamental challenges in studying non-coding regulatory elements um, is that uh, the sequence or the chromatin feature does not predict whether or not that enhancer is gonna be important. And even is important does not predict what cell lineage and, and developmental stage might be important. So often you're gonna see uh, in the literature uh, uh, in your, uh, um, by talking to your colleagues, people say, oh, we found an enhancer, but we knock it out in the cell line, nothing happens. And it doesn't really mean that the enhancer is not important. It, it could be just that we're not looking the right cell type or the right developmental context. So what I, what I really uh, think, uh, think this system can be useful is that it allows you to uh, survey the enhancer functionality across the developmental time as well as developmental lineage uh, stages. And to specifically answer your question, uh, this is again something still puzzle us. If you look at the, the chromatin features uh, showing by this ATAC-C signal, these four enhancers does not seem to show any major differences. Uh, they all seem to have chromatin accessibility in HSCs, and hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, or have chromatin uh, accessibility in these differentiated myeloid cells. But when you inhibit them, only two of those enhancers seems to be important. And this is, has been showing repeatedly in other studies that when you knock out these enhancers as well, that only some of them are important, but others are not important. So the question is why and, and how to predict those functionally important enhancers is, is a big question for the field. So is, is, is it because I was looking at the, uh, the myeloid H3, H3K27, obviously the, the, the two that are important obviously have much higher um, yeah. K27 yeah. And, acceleration. And, and more K27 acceleration in differentiated myeloid cells, but the other two didn't seem to have strong, but this E has a E3 does have a little bit, although you can argue that there's quantitative differences. Uh, so it, it does correlate to some extent, but we have other examples to show that 
you could have an enhancer that gains as much of an activation mark and a chromatin accessibility, but when you inhibit them, uh, that that does nothing to that particular cell lineages. Whether okay. this is just not sufficient, uh, or whether this is a, a, a so. A, an, another related question is what makes this change? I mean, change the enhancer. I mean, look like I mean, at least for two of them, the enhancer function completely disappear in the BMP cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can kind of get a hint, hint from this uh, K27 acetylation chromatin accessibility data as well. So these enhancer are marked with these activation marks in hematopoietic stem cells. But uh, in myelo cells, you will see this mark, some of those mark uh, are, are maintained or even increased. Um, but in TMB cells, those marks are completely absent. So, so these, uh, from, in those scenarios, these data in the BNT cells make sense because these enhancers seems not uh, activated. Uh, these enhancers are not functional at all uh, in, in BNT cells. Um, but as I guess your question is, you know, what determines whether the enhancer is going to be activated in myeloid cells versus BNT cells? And I, I think that um, the short answer is we don't yet know, but the uh, technologies like capture that I just described could be a useful way to, to dissect uh, whether or not um, there's a specific lineage specific transcription factors that uh, uh, bind to these enhancers in the myeloid cells, but not in BNT cells. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so, yeah, I think I can briefly uh, just mention here that uh, uh, in the first part of my talk, we found the enhancer control lineage uh, differentiation and disease phenotype and undergoes uh, a pretty extensive turnover during lineage differentiation. Uh, we engineered a capture method for multi-omic analysis of local specific chromatin interactions and feel free to reach out if any of you guys are interested in trying it. And we also have a, a enhancer targeting a CRISPR A, CRISPR I system for in vivo uh, interrogation of enhancers during development disease. I'm happy to share our experience protocols of reagent if you want to try in any other model systems. Um, so in the, in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, I want to switch gear a little bit talking about uh, the other 50% of the human genome that are long thought to be a genomic dark matter or junk DNA. These, these are repetitive DNA sequences. Uh, consistent with line ones and signs and other retro elements. Um, so this work actually started with our uh, long interest in identifying epigenetic mechanisms as uh, cancer specific dependency that might serve as uh, potential therapeutic targets. And this is particularly relevant to acute myeloid leukemia uh, because epigenetic dysregulation has uh, frequently been observed and, and due to mutation of some of these key enzymes uh, or, or gain of function activities of some uh, the other epigenetic regulators. On the, on the same time that um, uh, these um, uh, epigenetic alterations also create a selective and targetable dependencies uh, and resulting in therapeutic strategies uh, targeting several uh, epigenetic regulators. And one of the notable example is this uh, RDH mutations that increase the so-called uncle met uh, metabolize uh, to hydroxyglutarate to HG and, and these uh, can be inhibited using small molecule inhibitors to specifically uh, inhibit uh, the mutant RDH1-2 enzymatic activity. And this has been uh, clinically uh, approved, uh, FDA approved for uh, treating uh, human acute myeloid leukemia uh, patients. However, despite those knowledge, a comprehensive analysis of epigenetic dependency of human leukemia cells uh, has been lacking. So we saw that um, we could identify epigenetic dependency in human leukemia cells using a, a CRISPR knockout a, a dropout screen. And uh, we designed a, a, a um, domain-based CRISPR knockout custom libraries. And basically we collected uh, all the evolutionarily conserved epigenetic domains and uh, found about 300 of those uh, human epigenetic regulators and designed got on a specific targeting those evolutionarily uh, conserved domains. And then uh, we can use, uh, again, the cell growth best asset to count SGR enrichment or dropout uh, in a time uh, kinetic experiment uh, to nominate what are the epigenetic factors that are required for the uh, at least in vitro propagation of human leukemia cells. 
So we perform this screen in multiple human uh, myeloid or, or lymphoid leukemia cell lines. And I'm only gonna show you the data for a uh, representative showing in a, um, uh, the myeloid leukemia cell line MOM13 and a, a, a lymphoid leukemia cell line IH. So here showing a differentially uh, enriched or depleted uh, genes that, um, that are selectively affect either myeloid cell uh, proliferation or lymphoid cell proliferation. And this gene called Morphos 8 or MPBA in short caught our attention because it, uh, it is in the top hit uh, uh, based on sgRNA dropout in myeloid cells, but not in lymphoid cells. So uh, what is MPBA? So MPBA is a methyl uh, H3K9 binding protein. It's part of this complex called Hush complex. Uh, that is previously uh, identified to be required for the silencing of uh, transgenes as well as line one retrotransposons in the human genome. So MPPA uh, contains a chroma domain that can bind to H3K9 trimethylation to recruit uh, CDB1, which is H3K9 methyl transfers to induce heterochromatin formation. So when we look at the expression of these hush complex uh, genes, and we found that they're all highly expressed and uh, in uh, human acute myeloid leukemias, um, but their functional role have never been studied. Uh, uh, why this complex are, are needs to be highly expressed. So uh, we first validated this screen result using uh, uh, what we call an active selecting competition assay. So this is an interesting assay. Basically, you can generate an inducible Cas9 cell line, then you transduce with a guard on it together with a GFP reporter. But uh, with a, a lower MOI, such that only a portion of the cells will be trans, uh, transduced. And then you will uh, induce Cas9 expression, and the guard RNA will uh, target to the specific gene that you might be interested in, in this case, MPPA. So the idea is that if knockout of MPPA by this guard RNA targeting impairs cell proliferation or fitness uh, during propagation, this will lead to progressive loss of GFP positive cells. Uh, these guard on expression cells over, over time course. So we use this assay quite a bit. Um, um, and in this case, uh, nicely using four independent guard on to validate that MPP and knockout indeed impair cell proliferation uh, in vitro. And if you uh, xenotransplant these cells into an uh, immunodeficient NSG mice and observe leukemia, the MPA deficient cells uh, indeed uh, have much uh, um, um, a prolonged uh, disease survival and, and, and less leukemia burden uh, in, um, in these um, uh, transplanted animals. So this validates the initial starting from CRISPR knockout. So further, we use a, a domain screening. So in this case, we design gut RNA targeting individual domains across uh, the uh, coding sequence and find that really the chroma domain uh, targeting leads the most profound uh, effect uh, in terms of uh, cell viability. And more importantly, we can perform a functional rescue experiment. So in this experiment, we could deplete endogenous MPPA gene uh, using uh, uh, SHRNA targeting the 3 prime UTR. And then you can rescue with either a wide type or the, a different domain mutant form of MPPA CDNAs. And we found that a wide type, uh, uh, wide type MPPA can uh, certainly rescue the uh, uh, cell growth phenotype, um, and, but the Chroma domain deficient MPPA can no longer rescue, but the other domain mutant doesn't seem to be important. So all this says is that this uh, H3K9 binding activity of MPPA seems to be critical uh, for MPPA cell proliferation, uh, for ML cell proliferation. So based on those results, uh, we went ahead and generated a knockout mouse model and by using a, a pair of guard RNA targeting this uh, uh, chroma domain, including axon 2 MPPA, and uh, we can generate either a whole body homozygous knockout or a conditional knockout. So it turns out the whole body uh, uh, homozygous knockout resulting in uh, less than a Mendelian ratio of uh, POP suggestion that MPBA is required to some extent for early embryonic development. But those survived animals uh, actually, uh, despite they have reduced body size and weight and they have normal hematopoiesis and we also perform a bone marrow transplantation to assess the HSC function, did not notice any effect on HSC function. So suggestion that MPBA does not seem to be required for normal hematopoiesis, although it might play an important role in early embryonic development. So now we can determine uh, using these models, uh, mouse models, the in vivo rule of MPPA uh, in leukemia development. 
So we use uh, two well-established marine AML models uh, that uh, recapture like human AML containing fusion oncogene uh, runs from ETO or AE9A in short, or MLF9. So, so basically what the data shows is that um, uh, the knock, MPBA knockout cells uh, result in significantly decreased leukemia burden in peripheral blood, bone marrow, and spleen, and I fail to induce uh, lethal leukemia in the majority of the mice in both uh, AE9A or MPBA uh, uh, models. Similarly, uh, we can use a conditional knockout mouse by uh, a hematopoietic uh, specific but uh, induced BOCRI that can be induced by PIPC injection uh, to determine whether or not MPBA is also required for the maintenance of already developed leukemia. So the way you do it, you isolate uh, hematopoietic stem progenitor cell transform with these oncogenes, then transplant the recipient animal. But this time, you actually wait, uh, wait until the animal develops signs of acute myeloid leukemia by measuring 10% uh, or more of, of GLP positive uh, leukemia blast in the peripheral blood. And then you will inject with PIPC to induce MPPA uh, uh, knockout in these animals to, to determine what's the effect on leukemia propagation. And this data again shows that MPPA is uh, required for the maintenance of already established leukemia. So therefore, even MPPA is dispensable for normal hematopoiesis inactivation of MPPA seems to be incompatible with uh, both initiation and maintenance of myeloleukemia in vivo. So of course, we want to know what are the underlying mechanisms. So examine gene expression by RNA-seq. And, and we were very surprised to see that um, among the most upregulated genes, uh, many of them are annotated uh, line one retrotransposons, uh, especially these uh, young, uh, evolutionarily young line ones, such as the human specific line one called L1HS family. Uh, uh, specifically upregulated upon MPBA knockout in, in human and mouse leukemia cells. And furthermore, we can perform a chip sequencing of uh, three different antibodies for MPBA, and all showing that uh, MPBA are highly enriched in these human specific uh, line one elements, uh, and as well as uh, you also see some signal in other line one uh, subfamilies, but particularly human specific line one have uh, strongest uh, signals. So these uh, let us. Um, Let me interrupt. Are, are those yeah, yeah, sure. one elements are heavily marked by H3K9 trimethylation? Yeah, so this actually, I, may, uh, I didn't mention that. So H3K9 okay. methylation is also highly enriched over there. Yeah, so okay. it goes along so, uh, very so we, well with K9 in the K9 in, in the mutants, in the uh, mutants, do you lose those? You yeah, know, that's what a happens? Good, yeah, it's a good question. So if you do uh, um, acute deletion, and this is what we did, because uh, the cell will die over time. Uh, you can, I mean, if you have a, a way to line up, you're gonna see all the indirect effects. So if you look at the early deletion, you don't see major changes in H3K9 trimethylation. This makes sense because this is a reader protein and that binds to K9 and recruits set DB1, which is a K9 methyltransferase. But we did notice that if you actually propagate the cells long enough before they crash out, you do see a reduced H3K9 methylation. And this suggests that the, the MPBA mediated propagation of this heterochromatin um, and, and can also play an important role, uh, maybe so, from this in vivo experiment. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, yeah. So when you have this upregulation of expression of those 91 elements, is that because of the loss, or is it because of the loss of the propagation of T3K9 trimethylation, or is some other? Because this RNA-seq was performed in uh, relatively early time points, so uh, I would like, like to propose is that the loss of MPPA or harsh MPPA binding was sufficient to alleviate the repression um, um, mediated by H3C, H3K9. But um, we haven't. I, I think we haven't directly measured the S3K9 levels um, at these line one elements by chip C, for example, um, uh, in, in these early time points. But I, I, I would think that over time, the S3K9 trimethylation level would decrease in the absence of harsh MPPA. But even in the absence of a decrease in the early stage, you can see the upregulation of gene expression, meaning the somehow, even though you still have the S3K9 mark, but the hydrochromatin was somehow, um, it, it's been... 
Yeah, let me, let me clarify. We have not measured by chip sequencing, more quantitative method, whether or okay. not H3K9 trimethylation would be uh, reduced upon MPPA knockout in, in the early time points. We, we measure by Western blood, the global level of H3K9 seems to be decreased at the later time point. But, but in the early time points, we did not see changes in the global level of H3K9. But okay. doesn't mean that the H3K9 level uh, are still the same um, um, at the line one elements. And that, yeah, that's a, that's a great question that, that uh, might help us to understand how line one is regulated. Does that, does that address Yeah, you? yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> great. So yeah, so this finding led us to focus on line one uh, transposable elements. Um, so, so as I mentioned, 50% of the human genome are these uh, repetitive sequence derived from mobile DNA elements that has sought to be evolutionary uh, junk DNA. Among them, uh, about 21% of the human genomic sequences encoding these um, line one retrotransposons. Um, and the retrotransposition of these line one elements can also mobilize non-autonomous retrotransposons such as sign elements, a Liu sequence, uh, even some pseudogenes and mRNAs. So in total, uh, line one activity has sought to contribute to nearly one third of the human genomic sequences. Um, and that's uh, quite large in my view. <clears throat> so, Line one encodes two proteins uh, for retrotransposition. Um, open reading frame one is the RNA binding domain uh, proteins, and open reading frame actually have the endonuclease activity and a reverse transcriptase activity that are required for um, uh, cell propagation of line ones. So there are uh, more than half million copies of line one in the human genome, but only about 100 to 140 of those line ones uh, are still have retrotransposition activity, uh, are considered the so called hot line ones. And these guys have been thought to be the major sources of genetic mutations in a variety of human disorders, and including cancer. In fact, the first uh, disease causing line one retrotransposition uh, was uh, reported by Hank Zanian in 1988 uh, in a, a two family cases of hemophilia A, 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 a disease that is caused by uh, retrotransposition, retrotransposal insertion into uh, um, uh, this gene called factor A gene that leads to disruption of this gene in familiar case of hemophilia. So because line one retrotransposition can lead to mutagenesis, line one has long sought to be a, 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 a potential oncogenic uh, and, um, because their activity can promote uh, uh, genetic mutations and chromosome alterations. And this is indeed uh, shown by recent uh, pan-cancer genomic analysis and showed about uh, nearly half the hu uh, human cancer samples contain somatic uh, retrotransposition event and predominantly driven by line one activity. And these results in line one associated quantum rearrangement or structural variants that are, are seen in uh, more than uh, uh, half of the uh, human cancer cases. But if you look at the data carefully, interestingly, the prevalence of line one associated structural variants varies considerably among different cancer types. For example, some solid tumors uh, such as uh, adrenal carcinoma, head and neck cancers have almost 90% of the cases have uh, line one associated structural variants, but a myeloid leukemia such as AML that we study, a myeloid proliferant neoplasm has some of the lowest line one activities. So the biological significance underlying mechanism for the tumor type specific rules of retrotransposal uh, are still not known, are still uh, unknown. <clears throat> and because our study uh, points to a potential uh, tumor suppressive function of line ones, uh, so we first examine the expression. So it turns out that line one, this is major MRI expression in line one. Uh, they're highly expressed actually in normal hematopoietic stem cells or the progenitor cells, uh, although uh, there's some uh, uh, variation among different populations, but it's quite striking that in these transformed leukemia cells, um, that there's a 20 to 50 fold suppression of line one uh, MRI expression. And this is consistent with our finding that reactivation of line one by knockout MPPA uh, impairs leukemogenesis. And we also look at this in the human samples. Uh, I won't go into this detail. So uh, bottom line is by, uh, we found that in multiple independent cohorts, that expression of line ones um, is significantly downregulated in primary uh, MDS, AML samples, 
And line one is also lower in leukemia stem cells compared to leukemia blast. And leukemia stem cells are thought to be the, uh, the, the major driver of uh, um, uh, leukemia uh, relapse. Furthermore, uh, a lower line one expression is associated with a poor survival in human AML patient, um, patients. So uh, given all these findings, so we want to first confirm that MPB and knockout indeed uh, reactivate line one. And that's what we've been seeing uh, at both MR expression and a protein level expression using an antibody against uh, the open reading frame one and two independent AML cell lines. So up to this point, we have uh, shown you that uh, uh, harsh MPBA seems to be important to silence line one in human AML cells. But this actually do not directly address whether or not the reactivated line ones are capable of retrotransposition is activity that uh, is supposed to be important for line one function. So we adapt these uh, line one retrotransposition report assay by placing an EGFP reporter uh, with, a, uh, with a intronic sequence in a three prime UTR of a four lens line one, but in a, in a reverse orientation. And this is driven by a CMV promoter. So upon line one transcription splicing to re, uh, remove this uh, intronic sequence, and integrate into a, a, a new genomic location, the reconstituted uh, EGFP can now be reactivated. And this provide a measurement for de novo retrotransposition activity. So you this assay, uh, we observed that the retrotransposition rate in Y-type AML cells were very low, uh, but markedly increased upon MPD and knockout. And this is consistent with the increased line one gene expression. And furthermore, this retrotransposition, uh, retrotranscriptase activity can be inhibited uh, quite effectively using a small molecule inhibitor called 3TC uh, is a clinically approved antiviral compound. And these can uh, effectively uh, block retrotransposition as shown over here. And I won't show in the data, this also abrogated the MPP and knockout induced phenotype. You basically can rescue the cell growth phenotype by inhibiting retrotransposition activity. Uh, in these knockout cells. So the next question is, uh, now if you reactivate line one itself, would that be sufficient to phenocopy MPPA knockout? If so, this will argue that uh, much of the phenotype that, you, uh, that we are seeing due to MPPA knockout uh, is caused by a line one uh, retrotransposition. So we uh, fortunately obtained a, a transgenic mouse model containing uh, the similar re reporter uh, system that I described, uh, driven by uh, how, um, how uh, constitutive active cake promoters. So uh, we first va validated that in primary hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, this reporter is indeed active. Uh, so now we can transform these either white type or the reporter expression cells um, uh, um, by these leukemia drivers to examine their effect on leukemia uh, development. Indeed, we find that line one activation uh, due to this uh, transient expression was sufficient to block leukemia development in many of those trans, uh, transplanted animals. So argues that uh, um, line one reactivation was responsible for much of the phenotype we're seeing. So finally, um, <clears throat> we want to know why AML cells need to suppress line one retrotransposons. So one hypothesis that we have been tested is that uh, a variant line one activity is known to cause uh, double strand DNA breaks, and this might uh, lead to a loss of genome integrity to impair the self renewal capacity of AML stem cells. So, to test this, uh, we uh, use gamma H2AX as a surrogate for double strand DNA break uh, damage. And indeed, there was a, a quite significant increase of gamma H2AX foci in the MPP and knockout cells which can be abrogated by this small molecule inhibition. And this is also accompanied by increase of P53 and P21 expression, this so-called the sensors for DNA damage response. So then we argue though, if, we, if that's the case, you knock out P53 or P21 and should abrogate MPP and knock out phenotype. And I won't go into the details, that's indeed the case, uh, showing this, uh, this um, uh, either MPP uh, knockout together with P53 knocked down, or MPB knockout together with P21 knockout, in both cases that uh, knockout of these DNA uh, damage sensors could uh, restore leukemia development. Um, so this study demonstrated that uh, the harsh MPB and mediated suppression of line one retrotransposons uh, seems to be critical to safeguard genome stability of AML stem cells. 
and to promote self-renewal MS, MS, uh, MS stem cells. And this study also established a, a somewhat unexpected tumor suppressive or tumor protective roles for uh, retrotransposons as a selective dependency of myeloid leukemia. So I, I'm gonna skip this very quickly. I notice I'm running a little bit over time. I will just basically uh, mention this final summary. So uh, as we know, it, with the explosion of uh, genomic and epigenomic information in recent years, uh, we have learned a great deal of how genome regulation controls normal development and how dysregulation of this process contribute to human diseases. However, what we currently didn't know only represents a very small portion of the complex human genome. So in retrospect, and more relevant to our studies, the first documented cases of sickle cell anemia was described by James Herrick in 1910. And this was uh, later adopted as a first molecular disease by uh, Linus Pauling in 1949. And in hence it was discovered 40 years ago, the human uh, genome was uh, completed uh, 20 years ago. And now uh, after century of the discovery of sickle cell disease and 40 years after the enhanced discovery, we might have the first enhanced targeting therapy for sickle cell disease very soon. So by focusing on enhances a non-coding regulatory genome, we hope to identify new mechanism and genetic pathway in blood cell development and, and in the longer term to develop enhanced targeting therapies for uh, either inherited or acquired blood disorders. So with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge all the people who have contributed to this work. The initial B-cell enhancer work was done in collaboration with Dan Bao, Vijay Sangwa in Stu Hawkins lab. Development capture was done by my first postdoc, now he has his own lab, uh, Xin Lu. And uh, the increased A and I system was developed by two talented postdoc, Kalong Li and Xuan Liu. Uh, both are transitioning to their faculty positions now. And the line one uh, work was done by another postdoc, uh, Ziming Gu, who um, also secured a faculty job. And uh, also together with collaboration with John Abrams and many colleagues here at UT Southwestern. So I will stop here and take any question that you might still have. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm a little bit over time. Well, beautiful talk. Um, thank you, Jane. Any questions? So um, I will ask. Um, I'm a question first. So I'm a bit surprised. The 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 activation of the nine one alone is, is sufficient. It recapitulate all the phenotype of the MPP eight um, knockout. Yeah. So I mean, quite frankly, we we were a little bit surprised as well. The reason is uh, twofold. Number one. Uh, Hush MPPA, although it's one of the major players uh, in repression uh, retrotransposons, but you also repress other uh, repetitive element um, as well as other actually uh, uh, transcription factors, zinc finger transcription factor particularly. So we weren't quite sure whether line one reactivation was, was what it really does um, in terms of um, uh, uh, suppression is, uh, is activity in acute myeloid leukemia. The second is that, uh, as, as you know, um, there's many copies of line ones, uh, 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 half million copies, although only about uh, 100 or so those are active. So we're also not quite sure whether or not just over expressing a single copy of line one will be sufficient to cause a phenotype. But in retrospect, I think the reason it works, number one, is that um, these um, that, that this reporter that we've been using actually can, can generate quite a bit of activity. And this is also accumulating over time. In other words, that the source copy uh, can not only activate it once, can be multiple times as a cells replicate. And this might lead to accumulation of the downstream effect that we might be seeing. And the transgenic mouse that we have used has a housekeeping promoter that activate in pretty much um, uh, all cells, and we measure the expression is pretty high in, in, in the primary cells. So all cells can consider, I think, uh, much of the effect that we're seeing um, due to MPPA loss, uh, likely uh, were recapitulated by high copy number uh, uh, activation or uh, activation of many copies of line one retrotransposons using our report assays uh, of the transgenic mice. Okay, thank you. DJ, you have a question? Yeah, um, I have a question about the uh, first part of the talk. Mm -hmm. And the maybe a technical uh, question about this enhancer CRISPR-I and enhancer CRISPR-A. Mm -hmm. So, so the, my understanding of your design is such that 
um, you are basically using a guide RNA, right, to target uh, either transcription activator or repressor to a particular sequence. Mm -hmm. so, so if that is true, then it really does not matter, right, whether you need to know the information about, you know, what the, this particular um, a sequence is an enhancer or is, or is not an enhancer because you are basically doing an additive experiment, right? Mm -hmm. so Epigenetic additive. As long as you, you, you insert a repressor to somewhere in the genome, uh, I mean, around that gene, uh, the locus or, or activator around that locus, you will either inhibit or activate the transcription. So, so I'm trying to, um, I mean... Well, yeah, so the question how is... How um, that can give you the information about the the particular enhancer sequence, right? Yeah, so, so I think that the question boils down uh, whether or not if you just put some repressive or activating histone mark at anywhere in the human genomic sequences, would that cause any impact on gene transcription? Yes. Um, the answer is likely no, that we know it that um, only a, a, a small portion of the human genomic sequence have this re regulatory potential. And the regulatory potential, in my view, are defined as they are enriched for a, a specific uh, uh, a binding site or their combinations of transcription factors. So, so opening up those chromatin, uh, uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, DNA sequences by open chromatin structures would facilitate transcription factor binding and uh, subsequent recruiting co-activators and, and leads to transcription activation. So to specifically address your question, we actually did experiment that we designed Garang at a different uh, distance to the enhancer that we want to activate or repress. So basically you can design a Garang right on top of the enhancer, uh, predicted enhancer uh, center, and then we move them uh, 500 best pair away and one KB away, two KB away to see, do you always get the same effect? The answer is no. That you you get the maximal effect if you put CRISPR I or CRISPR I right, right on top of the enhancer compared to if you're putting like 500 best pair away. Although you can, if you, you, you can put in like 100 to 200 a couple of nucleosome and that still might have uh, effect to activate or repress the enhancer. But certainly if you move uh, a large distance away, the, the, uh, the activity decays uh, from this system. So, so that's, I think this is a useful tool if you already have a candidate of cis element, enhancers that are associated with disease or enhancers that are developmental or regulated, but you don't know whether those enhancers are functional relevant or have any activity in driving gene expression. And this assay can not allows you to do a multiplex screen in a single experiment to give, a, give you a ranking list of enhancers that might have you, uh, give you the strongest effect. Yeah, yeah, I, I get your point. You know, why not? If if the goal is to really functionally annotate those, in, you know, putative enhancer, right, mm -hmm. uh, sequence, why not just do you know base pair changes or or deletion, a small deletion or you know like base pair changes to to get that information? Because I'm I'm concerned that they you know you can put like I said maybe not you know. Five, you know, you know, KB, you know, five fifty KB away. But that, my point here, if you put it close enough to your enhancer, uh, maybe several hundred base pair away, you you will function. I mean, this this activator or repressor will have a function on transcription. Mm -hmm. But that information doesn't really tell you whether the original sequence you're suspecting to be an enhancer is a real enhancer. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I, why I, not uh, just to do a deletion or small nucleotide changes there? Yeah, so I completely agree with you in a way that, depending on what question you're asking. So if you already have your enhancer, say this is, this is the enhancer, you're already showing that if you delete the enhancer as a functionally important, and, and, and then uh, using kind of a Cas9 best editing uh, or deletion uh, would be helpful to dissect what are the regulatory uh, uh, landscape, what are the uh, uh, transcription factor binding side that are important for that particular enhancers. But the problem we are trying to deal with here is that uh, if you do any chip sequencing in any uh, differentiation model, you're going to find thousands of enhancers that are dynamically changed during mm -hmm. each differentiation. Uh, the change of this enhancer uh, chromatin feature does not mean that they are functionally relevant. So very often we don't really know 
what are the important enhanced elements that drive gene transcription to promote or inhibit lineage differentiation. So this method provides a, a, a first pass uh, survey of uh, a candidate enhancer when you activate or repress will have a functional impact in lineage differentiation. And then right. when you can go back and, and take out each one of those enhancer to the care for uh, base editing or and Cas9 editing as you wish to, to get on the kind of the deeper mechanistic inside how that enhances regulate. And this is related kind of to, to the workload because doing each one enhancer dissection is quite a lot of work um, and, 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 and to learn those mechanistic insights. So this method, I think it, it provides a screening method to identify okay. candidates, yeah. but doesn't give you the ultimate mm -hmm. answer in terms of understanding how that enhances regulate. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, because of the time, and uh, we have to stop here. Thank you very much, Jane. And if any of you have additional questions, you're welcome to stay a little bit to discuss with Jane. Thank you.